my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Crate and Kids. Crate and Kids understands the joys, surprises, and challenges that come with having a baby. That's why their warm and modern designs are made to keep your growing family safe and comfy while you keep your sense of style. Use the code THEBIRTHHOUR10 at checkout to receive 10% off your full price purchase of kids' furniture and accessories at CrateandKids.com. It's valid online only and some exclusions apply, so see their website for details. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Emily Jury from Crate and Barrel about creating kids' spaces that nurture and develop creativity. And before we get to today's birth story, I just wanted to give a big thank you to all of our new listener supporters via Patreon. It's been so fun getting to know all of you guys in our private Facebook group for that community, and we're getting closer and closer to our goal of launching a Patreon-exclusive podcast, which will be my husband interviewing partners on their perspective of birth stories, so I can't wait for that to come soon. If you're interested in joining that group and pledging your support for the podcast, you can head over to thebirthhour.com slash support or patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's birth story guest is Kayla. Kayla is going to be sharing a hospital birth story where she was able to use therapy balls, labor bars, and spent almost the whole time in a labor tub. Hi, Kayla. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm excited to be on. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah. So um, we are currently up in Boston. My husband and I have a 17-month-old. We recently found out we are expecting our second. I'm home full-time with my son and we just love it up here. We've been up here for about five years and in our free time, we love to get outside the city, explore downtown. And that's just a little bit about us. All right. Well, congrats on baby number two. Thank you. Um, All right. Well, let's go back to finding out you were pregnant with your first. Yes. So when I found out I was pregnant with my son, I, I didn't know what to expect in terms of labor and delivery. To be honest, I didn't really start thinking about it until I was probably halfway through my pregnancy, which blows my mind now because after going through it, you would think that it's one of the very first things you kind of think about and just kind of what you want, you know, kind of coming up with who your who your team will be going into it. I didn't really think about any of that until, you know, like I said, about halfway. So I found out I was pregnant with him. Um, and I would say that kind of right off the bat, I started just kind of questioning the way that things are typically done in terms of even how I manage my first trimester nausea. You know, I wasn't so keen on just taking all of these medications and and whatnot. Um, I was seeing an OB at the time. I remember right around the 20 week mark, I told her that um, I think I'm going to try and go unmedicated for this birth. (laughs) And to her, she thought that was pretty crazy. She said, oh, you have no idea what to expect. You know, if I were you, I would just go into it very open-minded. If you have to get the epidural, get the epidural. We had talked a little bit about maybe having a doula. My OB wasn't too keen on that either. And so I think just right away, I, I just started reading and researching um, and having an unmedicated birth just seemed like the best option for me and for my baby. Um, So I'd say right about halfway, I just started reading and devouring everything I could on unmedicated birth and decided in the second trimester that I was going to give it a go. So I didn't end up going into into it with a doula, um, but my husband was a phenomenal birth partner. We chose to deliver at um, a hospital downtown with um, an OB practice. Um, just because I, you know, at the time I didn't know much about um, midwives. Again, doulas, I just, I kind of knew a little bit from friends' experiences, but that was kind of my, my journey from the moment I found out. 
and kind of trying to think forward to labor and delivery and what my goals were for that. Okay. So do you have anything else that came up during pregnancy you want to share about, or do you want to just jump into the birth story? In terms of pregnancy, I'd say I had a a pretty healthy pregnancy. Um, First trimester kicked me around, same way did this time, which is a bit different now having a 17-month-old running uh-huh. around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it was a pretty good, it was a pretty good pregnancy. Um, my son, he turned upside down. I want to say he was like 16 weeks and he turned upside down and did not move for the rest of the pregnancy. And he was very low lying. There was this ongoing joke at my work at the time. He never came above my belly button. So he, all of the pressure was on my hips and on my bladder. Um, There, you know, I could literally press as hard as I could anywhere above my belly button. He just was never up there. Hmm. Um, So I never had any, you know, rib shots or anything like that. But carrying him was like carrying around a bowling ball. um, (laughs) On your bladder. (laughs) Exactly. For, um, yes, for a long time. So other than that, um, it was a pretty pretty healthy pregnancy. It is funny now going through a pregnancy the second time, knowing what I know now, um, because there are so many things that I know now that I had no idea with my son. This time we are choosing to go with midwife care at a birth center. Um, Even though my first experience, you know, at a hospital was great with an OB. There's just so many things that I, I know now that I'm trying to Um, do a little bit differently this time. So pregnancy was great. I am excited to have just a little bit more individualized care this time around. Um, And that could just be, you know, the the place that I'm going to. Um, But overall, it was it was really good. I remember hitting second trimester and feeling incredible. So I'm looking forward to that this time. (laughs) Yes. Um, And yeah, really no, no complications, which I was very, very grateful for. Yeah. All right. So how did labor start for you? So, um, the interesting part, like I said, my son was very low lying. Um, so they had told me that he could be premature. I don't know. You're probably very familiar with stations like zero plus one plus two. Um, he was at plus two station from like week 33 on and plus three is like crowning, right? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. Oh, yes. <laughs> Wait, and he had flipped at this point, I'm guessing. Yep. They put me on bed rest. Um, I stopped work. Um, I was still healthy. I still felt great. He was just so low that they, you know, they want to be cautious. So they said, you know, he might be premature. They'd given us stuff to read up on. And lo and behold, he was late. <laughs> so when did he flip from breach to head down? Because I'm sure people are wondering about that. He was head down from week 16 on. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying that he was breached starting at 16 on. No, okay. sorry. He was upside, by upside down, I mean, perfectly head down. The right way. He was the right way, but you know what I mean, upside down um, and never, never, ever switched from that spot. So he was like engaged, ready he to go. He was ready. Yes, right. he was ready. Um, so... So we were ready. We thought he was going to come early. And of course, I had, you know, a lot of, you know, just early labor symptoms starting from probably 35, 36 weeks. Um, And so we just, we thought he could come any day and we had everything ready and prepared. Um, He came at 40 and three. I remember once, once his due date passed, I'm like, okay, I got to get him out because mentally I was expecting him for a while. Um, So I remember the night before he was due, we walked all around the city of Boston for probably about three and a half hours. And it was the heat of the summer. (laughs) It was, oh my goodness, people must have seen us and thought we were crazy. We were walking up and down hills and looking back, I'm like, my goodness, I should have just saved my energy because I really needed it. And this baby would have come when this baby was supposed to. So we walked up and down all the hills, and uh, then that next morning, the very next morning, it was probably about 5 a.m., um, and I had woken my husband up several times over the past month saying, honey, I think this is it. <laughs> so when I woke him up that morning, he said, okay, why don't you just try and go back to bed? I'm like, no, honey, I really think this is it. Then I was just in the bathroom, just kind of pacing for a bit. 
start to have some bloody show. And then I called my OB right away. And, you know, first time mom, I'm like, I think I need to come in right now. And she was very keen on, she said, okay, why don't you get, get here? So we got there. It was definitely premature looking back now. I definitely wish I had labored at home a bit more. Um, I think I would have been way more comfortable, um, just in my own space. It took a while. Um, we delivered at one of the most popular, uh, hospitals in Boston. So we were in triage two or three hours. Um, and there's, you want to be anywhere but triage when you're in labor. Um, so we were there, um, just kind of pacing for a bit. We would have a doctor come in and check on us every now and again. And, um, things were progressing pretty quick. I could feel everything progressing. I remember telling my husband, I I just need to go to the bathroom. If they could just show me where the bathroom is, everything would be better. And I was just convinced that I just, I really needed to go to the bathroom. When they heard me say that, they're like, okay, let's get her a room. So they, um, they brought me to a room. This hospital is great. They have two rooms reserved for um, unmedicated births. So they have in those rooms uh, labor tubs. They have um, squatting bars. They have therapy balls. It was wonderful. Um, so they're walking me down there, and then they stop and say, oh, I don't know if either of the unmedicated rooms are available and clean right now. So we'd stop in the middle of the hallway. They had to go take care of, see see if they could get it um, sorted out for us. And at this point, I'm just beside myself, really just wanting nothing more than to get in a tub, to be able to dilate. Because really that whole morning, they just kept saying, you know, you're not making any progress at all. And I knew if I could just relax because I felt how tense I was. I felt how tense I was in triage with the doctors checking me. Um, I knew my body just needed to exhale. Finally, they came back. They found an unmedicated birthing room for us and they started drawing the tub for me right away. And that was amazing. They had this nurse come in. I swear I will remember her for the rest of my life. She came in and she said, all right, mama, you got to strip down, get everything off, get comfortable. You know, I want this to be as, as comfortable as possible. She positioned me on the therapy ball while she drew the tub for me, um, was giving me some counter pressure. She was phenomenal for not having a doula. Um, she, the support she gave me was incredible, was able to coach my husband through so many things. Um, finally the tub was ready. This is just a funny uh, little part of our story that we will always remember. I get into the tub and I'm sitting there and all of a sudden the tub just starts overflowing just everywhere. I mean, it is just, So we shut the water off and it won't stop. It is just overflowing. They can't get it to drain. And then they can't, they turn the water back on. They can't get the water to turn back off. And so I'm in there and the tub is just completely overflowing. You can't walk. I mean, there's like two to three inches of water now in my birthing room. (laughs) And so um, the nurse calls in, she says, are you okay with if we just get people in here to get buckets of water, oh so I am, I am laboring. I am like people. What do I mean? I like am bringing the in maintenance all, crew. <laughs> I am in all my glory in this birthing tub oh right now. Oh my gosh! And she said, you know, it, it's either that or we have to switch rooms and you have to walk down the hallway. And I'm, I mean, I'm in the middle of laboring at this. The moment I got into that tub, my body just exhale, and I knew things were starting to progress. I just felt everything opening up, and so I said. All right, bring in the teams. So there are people just with buckets of water coming into my labor pool, dump, bringing it out the hallway, dumping it out. Long story short, not only do they do that, I still have to switch tops oh, no. in the middle of labor. Honestly, it is something that, that my husband and I locked eyes as this was all going on, and we just started cracking up. <laughs> and we were just like, oh, my goodness. And, oh my you know, it was, it was just a funny story that we get to look back on now. And, you know, I almost think that it was just what I needed to kind of erase the morning of all of that tension and just exhale and release and just kind of let everything go. You know, I think I had so much pent up tension and stress. So anyway, we walk right next door. Everything's all set. We're in the birthing tub. And right away, I think all morning, I was at like 
a three or a four and I, I couldn't move past it. And we get into the birthing tub and right away, I think I opened up to a seven and it was like transition. They were pretty great about being able to labor the entire time um, in the water. But the time, the moment that you started to crown, the OB wanted you out so that you could push on the bed um, or just not in the water. And so that was my plan. I planned on laboring all the way up until, you know, I was nine centimeters. But the moment that I hit seven and I started transitioning, my water broke and the entire birthing pool turned dark brown. And right then I said, oh, meconium. And I knew it. And I remember I was before transition, just praying over, you know, the safety of the baby and health and against meconium. Um, I said, okay, that's okay. Um, but honestly, that labor pool, I mean, that was everything. I truly believe that that is like, I don't know how I would have gotten through labor without water because it was just such a natural pain reliever for me. There was, um, like the shower head that my husband was using as counter pressure on my back. And it was the most relaxing thing for me. Um, so that was a bit disappointing because I had to get out. They had to hook me up to a bunch of fetal monitors, to make sure my son was okay. But in between contractions, the nurse would, and she probably, I don't know what the protocol was, but she would allow me to go into the shower where I could just get that same kind of warmth, pain relief. And there was a shower head in there and I would just labor on the therapy ball in there, which was incredible because she would just kind of help my husband roll it around side to side, which opened my hips up a lot. But it was nothing, and I mean nothing like the pool. So that took a while for me because I think I tensed back up um, after that, and it was just, I almost felt myself fighting the contractions, and everything that I knew, everything that I had read, I mean, in that moment, totally went out the window. I was just like, I, I can't, I'm not giving in to the contractions the way that I want it to, Um and so I decided to just get out of the water, um, try something new, maybe squatting, really just anything. And I remember at this point, I was pretty out of my mind. I just remember screaming for the doctor. And I told my husband before I went into labor, I was like, I'm going to be so calm and collected. And I'm really going to, you know, give way to the contractions and the waves. And I was in my room just yelling for the doctor. I'm like, please help get this baby out. My husband laughs because he said that really the only words that I said almost all day were please and help please help, please help all day long. And so the doctor would come in and my husband said, um, to be honest, there's, I mean, there's a small percentage of the day that I recall vividly. So much of it is what my husband has had to, to fill in. I don't know if you find that that's common, but it's interesting because I think I was just almost in this other world all yeah, like day. Yeah, labor land, a lot of people yes, call it. Yes, yeah. all day long. And um, so recalling it has, you know, so much of it has been what my husband has, has filled in all of the little details for me. So finally I got out and I remember the OB would come and check me and I just, I couldn't get to 10. And I remember just feeling like I want it so badly to push, which is funny because my whole pregnancy, I remember that that almost was what I feared the most was pushing. Um, and I, I longed for it because I'm like, when I can get to 10, there's something I can do. I can actually push and all of this pressure will be relieved. Until then, I almost felt like labor was just happening. I had no active part in it, which I know isn't true, but <laughs> that's how it felt. It felt like it was just happening to me. I couldn't do anything. Um, but for hours, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't get to 10. And so they let me back in the water because they were just like, there's something magical about that water for you. So I got back in the water and again, it just opened me right back up. Um, so I, I got out of the water. They came and checked me. I was at 10. It was time to push. And that was a whole other debacle of itself. Um, it took me, I want to say it was at least an hour, which I know some people have, you know, five hour pushing stories. Um, but for me, that felt like forever. Um, they brought out a mirror, which I know some people are like, oh my goodness, I would never want a mirror anywhere near me while I'm laboring. Um, 
But for me, I think it was incredibly helpful. They brought it out. Um, it was probably about 45 minutes into pushing. Um, and the before then, all I could feel was I put so much into getting my baby out. And then just to feel all of my hard work retract, it was so discouraging. I remember telling my doctor, I'm like, how Ever you have to get this baby out, get rid of all of the plans that I told you I had. And my husband's like, she doesn't mean that. She doesn't mean that. And my doctor, she was incredible. She got up really close to my face and held my hand. And she said, listen, your baby is right here. There is no other option. I will not perform a C-section on you because she knew that subconsciously that is almost what I was asking. That's how desperate I was to get him out. Um, and she said, you know, I'm not using a vacuum. I'm not using forceps. This baby is right here. We just need to work together. And that pep talk and the mirror combined, I swear, is what was able to get him out. Because right then and there, she pulled up the the crossbar um, that goes up and over the bed, which I told myself for forever all throughout my pregnancy. I said, I will not labor on my back. I will not labor in the bed. Um, but after an hour of pushing, I mean, you are willing to try anything that the doctor recommends, nearly anything that the doctor recommends. So we tried it. And between that, they had a, one of the towels wrapped around there. And I want to say within the next 15 minutes, we pushed him out. Um, we had an incredible team. They had the pediatric team up there to make sure my son was okay from the meconium. Um, and the nurse was phenomenal. And they all knew that from the moment that he came out, as long as he was healthy and okay, they checked him pretty quick for the meconium. Um, he cried right away. So that was great. They said, if he cries right away, we can place him right on your chest um, and they can kind of check him out from there. And so the moment he came out, I just said, give him to me. And they placed him right on my chest. Um, and he stayed there for my goodness. It was at least an hour, if not more. Um, and I mean, there was, there was nothing like it. Absolutely nothing like it. That adrenaline rush, um, truly there's, there's no words for it. <laughs> you had the labor land and the birth high. It sounds like right after. Yes. Yes. It was incredible. So how was your recovery, both, you know, immediate at the hospital and then once you got home? So, um, he had meconium and he was, he was down there. I mean, for almost an hour, he was, you could see every time I pushed his little nose would poke out, but his whole face was like very purple. Um, and so the OB made it clear, you know, the moment that his head pops out, she's like, I'm going to go in for him. I had expressed before that, you know, I would really prefer hands off as much as possible. But when, I mean, safety comes into play, I was like, get him out as, you know, however you can. And so again, they had the mirror down there. So I was able to see just exactly what she meant by having to go in there. Um, and so I had a pretty bad tear, which was also one of my biggest fears. So in the hospital itself, we were out with less than 24 hours, which is not their favorite. Um, I remember them begging the nurse, even especially as a first time mom, they were like, why, you know, why don't you just stay for 48 hours? And after that you can go home. But there was just something that I craved about wanting to be home in my bed. My mom was up. I knew she would be there for a bit taking care of me. So I just, I longed to be home. The nurses were great, but, um, once I got home, it was actually really nice for about a week. They had, um, a home nurse come. She came, I think, every other day to check on the both of us. Um, recovery, recovery is hard. Recovery is really, really hard. I remember not being able to stand straight up probably for about two weeks. Um, pretty sure I fractured my tailbone during labor. I had a lot of back labor and it was, I mean, my entire lower back was black and blue for two weeks. Um, not much you can do about it, unfortunately. So I laid in bed and iced a lot and then did a lot of sits baths. I'm pretty sure that's what helped with a lot of the tearing. Um, thankfully, my husband had an incredible maternity leave. So he was home for almost two months, which I know is incredibly um, rare. And I was very, very grateful for that because we don't have family up here. And that that was really 
really special to have him. In terms of, and I think people don't talk about your emotional recovery enough. So many people ask, oh, how are you feeling physically? I remember when my mom left, that was the hardest. I called her on her way home and I said, are you sure you can't come back? It was just a really big transition. I remember being up in the middle of the night with my son, nursing him and just looking down and feeling this huge weight of responsibility and love. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that you're mine. And it was just this over powering at times, um, emotion. I remember the first month was just, you know, the baby blues, you're just crying at absolutely everything, the good, the bad. I mean, everything sent me into tears. Um, but I would say really after that first month, um, we really start to find a nice groove, the two of us, um, between breastfeeding, I really felt like everything had recovered pretty well, um, you know, physically, and, and it was overall a pretty, pretty great recovery. You know, I would say that the hardest part was probably just the tearing. I remember not being able to sit up in nurse and that was pretty hard um, because I'd have to sideline, you know, trying to breastfeed a newborn. I mean, you need, you need like five hands that you don't have. So I just remember trying to figure all of that out. Sideline was, that was a fun task, but overall as you know, first time moms recovery can be pretty hard, especially if you don't know what to expect. But I, I like to think that it was a smooth recovery. Awesome. Yeah. It sounds mm-hmm. like you kind of had your support people in place and everything too, which is so, so huge. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that next time, this time, I guess I, I would definitely like to have more of a support team, you know, having my husband was great, but you know, even after he went back to work, I think so often we think of our support, you know, we have, think of people dropping off meals the first week or so, but we don't really think two months, three months, even postpartum, you know, sleep loss and so many different things. So I think having um, more of a support team in place next time would be, would be a good idea. (laughs) Yeah. Definitely help with the toddler as well. (laughs) Yes. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, do you have any resources you wanted to share? My favorite book that I read, um, and I'm sure you guys get this all the time, was Ina May's Guide to Childbirth. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the very first one that I read. It was funny because my sister-in-law had told me she gave birth um, just a few months before I did to her second child. Um, her first was not unmedicated. And then she said she, for her second, she was going to go unmedicated. And I remember the first time she told me that, I thought she was truly crazy. I said, why would you ever do that when you have such incredible, you know, medications and resources available to you? And, um, she recommended this book to me. And I remember just making my way through it. And my mind was blown just at the statistics. And to me, you know, I always just thought, you know, medications and hospitals and OBs, that is just the safest option for everybody. I didn't stop to think, you know, I think it just gave me a greater appreciation for the fact that the female body was truly designed to labor and that if I could just equip myself and empower myself with knowledge, it, I mean, it could make a world of difference for my perspective. So I remember just reading through it and by the end of it, feeling so empowered. And I remember before that, you know, the way I looked at birth was really from a fear mentality. Mm -hmm. And after that, just being so inspired and encouraged that, that not only can I do this, but, but other, I mean, we all, you know, if we can look at what our bodies are meant to do and really just come at this from an empowerment point of point of view, I mean, it's, it's really incredible. So I would say that that was my number one book recommendation. My husband read The Birth Partner, which I did not read, but he said that that was a really great tool for him. Um, And then we also read together The Bradley Method, which was very helpful for the both of us. Mm -hmm. Um, And honestly, I, my husband was phenomenal. I mean, I truly, so I don't know if it was the book, if it was his natural instincts or whatever it was, 
he knew he was so in tune with everything that I needed throughout the day. So if you are a husband listening to this, the birth partner would be a great book for you to get your hands on. (laughs) Awesome. Well, we'll put all those on the show notes page. And then did you want to share where people can find you to connect? Yes, I am over on Instagram um, at K underscore. And then my last name is Brookalary, B-R-U-C-C-O-L-E-R-I. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you so much for having me on. Now I'm going to chat with Emily from Crate and Kids all about creating a space for your kids that fosters creativity. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. So we are going to talk about some fun things around creating a nursery space, but I want to know a little bit about you for my listeners just to have some background before we get started. Sure. So my name is Emily Drury. It's pronounced like family, Emily like family. I like to tell people, um, I get asked every day how to pronounce it. <laughs> I'm a copywriter and content creator at Crate and Barrel and Crate and Kids. So I work on everything from our website and catalog copy to things like store signs, product descriptions, video scripts, blog content, and lots more. I'm also a mother to three children. I have a five-year-old son and twins who are 22 months old. Oh, wow. So I bet it's fun to be able to work with Creighton kids now, having kids of your own and knowing kind of your own style as well. It's great. I mean, I'm constantly shopping. My (laughs) husband is always like, why is another bag coming in the door? But (laughs) it's, it's a very tempting thing. We have so many great things to bring home for the kids. Yeah. All right. So today we're going to talk a little bit about creating those spaces for kids that nurture and develop creativity. So what are your main kind of tips and focuses on creating spaces that nurture creativity for little ones? So especially as our kids have started to get a little bit older, we have really turned over a lot of space in our house to the idea of nurturing creativity. We have a playroom upstairs that's all about toys and creative play with toys And then downstairs, we're lucky enough to have a little extra room off the kitchen that we have staged as the studio, we call it. My husband is actually a visual artist, so he is really enthusiastic about that space. And we have it set up just for artistic pursuits. We have the Creighton Kids Artsy Easel, which is a beautifully designed kind of modern looking easel that's super sturdy um, and also looks great in the space. And then just to protect against splatters and messiness, We have the splat mat and the art smock for the little ones to put on. In the studio, we also just constantly keep big rolls of paper and sketch pads that we pick up at real art supply stores and bins full of markers and crayons. There's a kid table and chairs. And we also have a little sofa in there for the grownups so that we can hang out and watch them while they create. Sounds amazing. I always love seeing these really cool spaces like that online. It makes me just want to hang out in them myself. Our kids are the same way, so I'm sure they get those same vibes when something like that is set up for them. Yeah. And I mean, a big thing we do in that space is just let them know that it's okay to be messy in there. So Mm -hmm. I'm not sure every adult would want to hang out in there. It makes me a little nervous at times too, but (laughs) You know, there's there's stuff everywhere and we just encourage them to get into it. And, you know, we just give them a space where they know they can kind of be free to create whatever they want. Yeah. I love that the Creighton Kids website is set up by categories for these types of things. So there's like the arts and crafts section and the imaginary play section and stuff like that. It makes it really easy to kind of find what you're looking for by theme rather than just product. Yes, definitely. If you're looking to set up a studio or creative space, almost any search word you type in will get you a whole list of great options. Great. Okay, so switching gears a little bit, what are some ways that you would recommend to set up your home to encourage reading with your little ones? So creating a fun little book nook in your home is a great way to encourage reading. And, you know, even more than one is a good idea. One upstairs, downstairs, in their room, in the living room. If kids have a fun place to sit with a story, I think it's more likely that they're going to pick one up. We like to do like a lot of open storage. We have some of the Creighton Kids Good Read book bins, which are awesome because you can arrange the books so the spines show and the kids have really easy access. They're low to the ground. And then at Crate and Kids, we also have these new novelty bookcases, which I think are super fun. A giraffe, a robot. Uh, We have a new one coming out. It's an elephant and also a truck. So that's a playful way to keep the books organized. Um, You can also use them for art supplies or toys. 
but really just having the books right out there where they can see them and then some comfy seating nearby is key to getting them to get excited about reading. In our house, another thing that's really important to reading is just making it like a special time to be together. You know, we turn off the TV, we snuggle up on the couch or a big pile of floor pillows. And, you know, especially on the weekends, we try to take the time to say, okay, there's no limit on the amount of stories we can read right now. This isn't, you know, bedtime where we say just one story and then we need to wrap it up. This is like, whatever you want to read, let's do it. Let's dive in. Um, let's let one book read lead to another one and, you know, just kind of spend the whole afternoon going through our library and enjoying what we have. That's so fun. Yeah. My, my older kids are just now getting into some early chapter books and it's so fun to just see them lay there and listen and think about it. You know, they don't have to see pictures they just kind of use their imaginations. I think another thing that's really fun is, you know, you said your kids are getting a little older and loving to get into chapter books. And one thing that I'm seeing with our kids too, is that our older son, even though he's a very early reader, is now thinking that it's fun to read to his uh, siblings who are much mm-hmm. younger. So that's such a just that's such a great game of pretend that kids can play, um, you know, school, library, whatever. It's so great to see him feeling like he has something to teach them. Um, it really warms the heart. Oh my gosh, it makes me want to cry every time yeah. I see it. I'm like, oh, they're being so sweet. I love it. <laughs> it's so adorable. Yeah. So other tips to help kids um, and foster their imaginations. So, you know, there's a lot of talk around screen time and limiting screen time, and we do try to do that as much as we can, although I'm sure like a lot of parents out there, we turn to the TV sometimes too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes we have even pretended like our TV is broken for the weekend and we'll drape a sheet over it and say, oh no, the TV, it's not working. It needs to be fixed. And then we'll spend the whole weekend just doing pretend play. And we will put out like the playhouse, the teepee, all the toys, get out all the dress up things out of the closets. And I think, you know, one thing to do is kind of let them play on their own as much as they will. I've heard that's a great way to develop their their sense of play and their imaginations. And, you know, I like to stay on the sidelines and kind of listen into what's going on. And maybe I'll pipe in with like a question or a suggestion to help them, you know, consider the possibilities or make up funny scenarios, you know, like if they're playing and they're, they're talking about fairies, I'll say to them, what does a fairy eat for breakfast or something just to kind of get them to giggle and think about that. Um, you know, if my son is drawing a house, which he loves to do, I'll ask him what's inside or what's that secret thing hidden in the attic that would be really crazy to find. Um, this winter, you know, we live in Chicago, it's freezing. And one thing we're loving this winter is the idea of an indoor camping trip. So we're playing camping a lot. My son is getting into the idea of it and we're hoping to start taking him camping soon. But in the meantime, we have this great um, campfire play set from Creighton Kids, and it's just a plush set um, that kind of helps you set the scene and pretend like you have a little fire in the house. And we pretend like we have s'mores and we're snuggling up to tell each other ghost stories. And I think it's just a great way for him to start to imagine what it's going to be like to do that outside. Mm-hmm. So fun. I love all of those imaginary play things. So many are just so creative. Just looking at them on the website, I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have even thought of making that. Yeah. It's very cool. And I think a great thing that we do with the toys at Crate and Kids is that, you know, it's not a lot of things that are powered by batteries and it's mm-hmm. not a lot of plastic things. It's it's more things that the kids can take and feel with their hands and kind of use their imaginations to decide what's going to happen with these things. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this last question uh, hits home for me because I'm kind of in this spot right now, but what advice do you have for moms who are trying to make room for multiple kids in one room, especially if they're like, you know, different ages by a, a few years? Yeah, so we're kind of grappling with this idea too. And one thing I'll say is that I grew up myself with a lot of siblings and sharing a room with my sister. And I think that although some parents may look at it as a challenge, I think in reality, it's just such an unbelievable opportunity to promote togetherness and sharing and cooperation with the kids. And I think what you can do is like, you know, even within the one room still designate spaces for each of the kids, like um, let them each have their own reading nook, let them each have their own little homework area or place to snuggle on the floor, but also build it in a way that encourages them to do these things together, you know? make it easy for them to move their things around to read together or, or play a game when the parents aren't in the room. 
And I remember, you know, like with my sister, what we would do every night before bed. And I know a lot of siblings do this is we would just lay there and talk each other to sleep. And I think, you know, our parents probably knew it was going on and they knew it was keeping us up, but they didn't care. They just thought it was such a great time for us to bond and be sisters. So really fond memories of that. And we're a couple of years apart. We're three years apart. So Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even if you think there's an age difference with your kids, they probably have more in common than, than you might imagine. Yeah, definitely. Are there any specific products or things that make sharing a room easier that you guys offer at Creighton Kids? Well, we just have so many beautifully designed wall decor and bedding options that I think what you can do is allow each child to choose what they like and decorate their part of the room in a way that makes them happy and express their individuality. But the items are all still going to look good together because they're such gorgeous colorways and designs and it's all just going to kind of blend and look modern and, and beautiful. Yeah, things that complement each other, but they're still maybe like unique favorite animals or things like that. Yes, exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much again to Kayla for sharing her birth story with us and to Emily for coming on and chatting about Creighton Kids. If you want more information from today's episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Kayla's name in the search bar. And don't forget that coupon code is thebirthhour10 for 10% off at creightonkids.com. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.